It really is very exciting to have uh, John Meacham uh, with us today. He's uh, a familiar presence at, at Politics and Prose, uh, and I'm sure uh, to a, a number of you in, in the room. Uh, John has been an, an accomplished journalist as a top editor of Newsweek and contributing editor to, uh, to Time. Uh, his uh, biography of Andrew Jackson won the Pulitzer Prize in, in 2009, and he's written other bestsellers about Thomas Jefferson, the relationship between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, uh, and the influence of religious beliefs on America's founding fathers. Uh, he's also an executive editor at Random House and, and a visiting professor at Vanderbilt University. Now, uh, to be honest, um, some of us here did wonder, uh, when we heard that John was coming out with a biography of George H.W. Bush, whether the book would prove much of a draw. Uh, clearly a certain nostalgia for the senior uh, Bush and, and what he stood for, qualities like, like decency and pragmatism and consensus seeking. seeking. A certain nostalgia has, has taken hold in, in the two decades since Bush left office. Uh, but he did fail to win a second term amid perceptions that he lacked vision uh, and was too effete. Uh, and his presidency seemed destined to be overshadowed in, in the history books by the larger personalities who came before and after. Uh, to our delight, and I'm sure to John's, uh, John's book, Destiny and Power, has turned out to be quite a hit uh, and an important contribution to better understanding our complex and consequential 41st president. Uh, John argues persuasively that uh, Bush's was one of the great American lives, one that embodied the, the 20th century, World War, Big Oil, Cold War diplomacy, and American global leadership. Drawing on the president's uh, private diaries and numerous interviews, John shows that beneath Bush's modest, deferential manner was a deep ambition and drive to win, uh, beneath his underwhelming speaking style was a sharp intelligence and abiding desire to serve and to bring peace to the world. And through his calm and prudent stewardship, some things of great lasting si significance were actually achieved both abroad and at home. Remarkably, too, John got Bush to share publicly some critical views of Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld and their roles in the presidency of Bush 43, and I'm sure you all have heard or read about those. Uh, and the biography couldn't have come at a more opportune time when another of Bush's sons is vying for the presidency, and the question of why the Bushes have proven so politically durable is before the country. Uh, a review in USA Today called the book Sympathetic But Not Sycophantic, written from Bush's perspective, uh, but with a journalist's rigor. Uh, no doubt we're in for a very illuminating discussion this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Meacham. Um, among the some who were worried about whether this would be uh, at all interesting included my seven-year-old daughter who, when asked what her father does for a living for the last three years, has said he's writing a biography of George Jefferson. <laughs> um, Sherman Helmsley gave me his diaries. Uh, it was great. Uh, I thought the portrait of Wheezy was quite strong. Uh, and trying to get it. Uh, this is, I'm delighted to be here. I first started spending money at Politics and Prose a quarter century ago uh, when I was at the Washington Monthly, so it wasn't very much money. Uh, but uh, was, uh, I've always loved being here and uh, want to talk about uh, the man first known as Poppy Bush and the one who now, I think, I hope, is coming to be seen as one of our more unjustly underrated presidents. Um, the journey started almost 17 years ago uh, when I uh, went up to Walker's Point with our friend Michael Beschloss uh, to uh, interview the president and Brent Scowcroft about his book on foreign policy. And as you all may know, interviewing George Herbert Walker Bush is a little bit like interviewing Dana Carvey. Um, <laughs> it's sometimes you wonder where parody begins and reality, reality picks up. Uh, one of the joys of doing this book, uh, and one of the interesting parts of it, is has been both going to the principles of our era, because Bush's career does, as Brad mentioned, it, it expands 
World War II, uh, the Texas oil business, uh, the politics of Texas in the 1960s, the Congress under Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, the United Nations during the Taiwan fight, the Republican National Committee during Watergate, what second prize? Um, the, you know, the Barbara and George Bush were among the first Americans to live in, in China, uh, obviously after the opening, director of the CIA, uh, a four-year candidate for president, uh, vice president for eight years. I mean, there's, there's sort of not much he, he wasn't around for. Um, so in, in talking to people, uh, whether it was his son, President Bush, or uh, Vice President Cheney, it was just always as though I was in conversation with the present and the past at once. And so one, one day this summer, in, in fact-checking various elements, I actually talked in the course of 60 Minutes to Henry Kissinger, Dick Cheney, and Dana Carvey, <laughs> who did Bush in character for the interview. So I'm not actually sure I wasn't talking to the president himself. Uh, but I asked, I asked Dana what, um, what, you know, how he came to the impression, and he said it was an underlay of Mr. Rogers with an overlay of John Wayne. So you get unleash orgy of death, you know, and you got to move the fingers and, and do all that. Not going to do it. Um, and of course, you have to avoid pronouns like the plague. You can know there, there are no pronouns to be had. And pronouns is where I'd like to start, because it, George Bush became George Bush because of his mother. Uh, we all became, I admit, that's not the most profound insight I hope that I will offer you. Uh, but he, his mother taught him two things. One was to be competitive and to win. And the other was to never talk about competing or winning. So you might see these as somewhat contradictory, but they were very real. It was a, the ambient reality of George Herbert Walker Bush's life was the implicit, and I think therefore all the more powerful expectation that Bushes were meant to win, to succeed but not to preen, and to uh, whatever arena in, of life in which they found themselves – there was an expectation that they would be the best there could be. But you wouldn't brag about it. You wouldn't talk about it. The stories are legion. Uh, Poppy Bush would come in and say, I hit a double today. And his mother would say, well, how did the team do, dear? Uh, his mother would say, never talk about the great I am. Don't be a braggadocio. So you would think that going into politics, which is part of the job requirement, is you actually have to use the first person pronoun and talk about yourself, would be an odd career choice for George Herbert Walker Bush. But shift to the other things she taught him. Compete, compete, compete. The Bush children knew that they were expected, without being told, to go out into the yard on Grove Lane in Greenwich and climb the tallest trees. The taller, the better. The taller, the, the more challenging, the more they were expected to do it. A neighbor lady once came by and warned Mrs. Bush that the children were so high in the branches. And Mrs. Bush said, they'll be fine. They have to learn. And what she meant was they had to learn to climb, to work, to succeed. And I think that these two forces were what shaped George Herbert Walker Bush often in conflict with one another, occasionally complimentary, but always there. And so as you follow him through his life, you can almost always ascribe some, you know, whatever question you have, to the triumph of one of these impulses over the other, or perhaps, at his best moments, a, a fortuitous intersection of those two, to compete, to succeed, to serve to be modest in an immodest business. These, these were his virtues. And I want to, I think chronologically, perhaps we should run through this because we are not going to see his like again in national politics. He's the last president of the World War II generation. He lost to the first uh, baby boomer president. I would argue that culturally and temperamentally, he has more in common with Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt and even the Founding Fathers in, in a way in which he saw public service as an extension of a prosperous life than he does with his successors, including to some extent his own son. 
it's hard to imagine two more different people than George Bush, than Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Um, and to some extent, 43, but we can talk about that in a minute. Um, so he was, he is a unique figure. He became president with one of the greatest resumes. Uh, he was often attacked for being the resume candidate. As he used to put it in his diary, what's wrong with having experience? Um, what's wrong with knowing what to do in government? Um, the diaries were essential. Uh, let me pause and talk about that for a second. Uh, unknown to many people, even those quite close to him, he kept audio diaries off and on as vice president and then consistently through the White House years. It was a little tape recorder he'd bought himself. He would talk into it, fill up a tape, have the tapes put in a White House safe. They'd go to Houston and be transcribed, and sometimes the transcripts would be sent back to the White House. Sometimes they'd be, be kept down there. But he did it at Camp David. He did it in the study upstairs at the White House. He did it in the study off the Oval Office, later made more famous by his successor for other activities, as we say. Um, that's what my seven-year-old calls activities, activities. Um, <laughs> Uh, sometimes on Air Force One, sometimes on Marine One. You can hear the jet engines. You can hear the blades of Marine One uh, as he comes in uh, to land, as he's doing these dictations. And it's as close as I'm ever going to get to being president of the United States, is listening to these diaries. Uh, biographers often have to try to infer what a president is thinking at a given moment. We do it from letters, we do it from oral histories, we do it from the testimony of others. Here we have a contemporaneous record of what the man was thinking, or at least what he was saying he was thinking. So there is that caveat. But if this is an elaborate Kaiser Sose moment, I would be stunned, uh, because he did this with such consistency. And they're the one document where he really does talk about how difficult it is to be president. It's the one place where he allows himself to complain a little bit. And never, never complain, never explain was also part of the Bush Code. But in the diary, speaking to himself and to history, he was willing to open up a little bit more than he usually did. He... Um, he once told me that no one ever wants to hear a president complain. No one ever wants to hear a president say, oh, woe is me. You're just damn lucky to be there. Uh, he, he said things that I don't think he would say to Mrs. Bush. He said things certainly that he would not have said to his aides. I had the remarkable experience for the past few years of taking different sections of the diary to the people he was talking about and saying this is what the president had to say. And on more than one occasion, they simply denied it. And I said, well, he wouldn't have thought that. I said, well, here's the tape, you know. Um, uh, uh, I won't mention any names, but, but Dan Quayle comes to mind. Um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's so, 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 anyway. Uh, what, so the tapes are, are hugely important, and they give you a running monologue of what it's like to be president in what Bush called a fascinating time of change in the world itself. But biographies about character, ca character is action. Um, so where did this man's character come from? My, my chief belief is that the combination of his experience in the Second World War, where on Saturday, September 2nd, 1944, in an operation codenamed Baker, he was taking out a, a communications and supply point for the Japanese on Chichijima and the Bonin Islands. He was shot down, he was, the plane was hit, he finished his mission, he dropped the bombs, he told his two crewmen to hit the silk, as he put it, he came back out to sea, uh, he turned the plane so that they could bail out, he then bailed out. He was nearly decapitated. Uh, he gashed his head on the, pl on the tail of the plane because he went out, but the plane kept going. So there's a gash here, a few more inches, and that would have been that. He lands deep in the sea, he comes up, he's vomiting. Um, something he would later do famously in Japan. So there are themes uh, emerging um, in the in the life. Um, I'm going to just pause for one second and tell you a quick. Uh, we'll, we'll come right back to Chichijima. But um, I'm sort of the go-to guy for obscure federal holidays. Um, if you need a speech given, you know, and it's Arbor Day, you know, 
FDR and trees, a reflection. You know, I can do that for you. Um, so for President's Day a couple years ago at my children's school, which was a kindergarten through eighth grade, I was asked to give a President's Day speech. And so on my way over there, I was thinking, well, what should I say? You know, how can I really get that, that age group, you know, six years old to 12 years old, engaged? And I struck on blood and vomit. <laughs> so I said, all right, I want to tell you all, you know, presidents bleed. Presidents are real people. And so Andrew Jackson of Tennessee was in a duel, and he let the other man shoot him first. And as his boot filled with blood, Jackson lowered his pistol and shot the other man dead. And that got some nods, you know. Um, and then I said, has anyone here ever thrown up on someone? And I am disturbed to report that a very high percentage of Nashville school children have thrown up on people. I don't know what it is. I haven't done it since Sewanee. Um, which is my alma mater at the University of the South, Downton Abbey meets Deliverance. You know, that's, that's, that's the thing. And so all these children's hands went up uh, about how they'd thrown up on someone. And so I said, well, George Herbert Walker Bush, in January of 1992, threw up on the Prime Minister of Japan. That night, and so you two can be pray at whatever point I was making. Uh, that night, I received no fewer than 32 emails from concerned mothers asking, was it true I had said, go home and throw up on someone, and you will become president of the United States? So that is a totally true story. Everything about that. Chichi Jima, he's coming back out across the Pacific. Um, go, bails out, hits the water down. He's, he's throwing up on the life raft. Uh, he's out there for four hours. If the wind and the tide had been blowing toward the island as opposed to away from it, he probably would have been captured. Chichi Jima was the scene of horrific war crimes, including cannibalism. For years, he would say to Barbara, I was almost an hors d'oeuvre. Um, and he had two, one of the many moments he cried with me uh, uh, during the, these interviews, which took place from 2006 until September of this, last, of this year. Um, and I, he would cry, I would cry. It was like the world's worst wasp-on-wasp -wasp therapy. I mean, we were just, we were, we were totally unsuited to help each other. Um, you know, in my family, we would, we would just cry if we ran out of ice. But, you know, um, uh, where's the old crow bottle, you know? Uh, was he had, so he cried when he talked about the two, the two men he lost, uh, Del Delaney and Ted White. And he thinks about them every day. He's thought about them every day for more than seven decades, going on eight decades now. And he had two questions. One was, did I do enough to save them? And the second was, why was I spared? Why was I spared? The answer to the first is yes, he did everything he was supposed to do. The answer to the second, I believe he's been trying to answer every day since then. I think he has been trying to make his life commensurate with the sacrifice of those men. He made it. He survived. What could he do with his life to justify his being spared in, in the words of the Navy hymn, in danger's hour? Totally believe that. The second is the loss of their daughter Robin to leukemia in 1953 when uh, neither George nor Barbara Bush had ever heard the word leukemia when, the two, when, when she was diagnosed in the doctor's office in Midland, Texas. Uh, she, they took her to Sl Memorial Sloan Kettering. She la lived another six months or so, but then died over the Columbus Day weekend in 53. Uh, the president, without fail, at the mention of Robin, begins, begins to cry. I asked him what he had learned from that. And he said that life is unpredictable and fragile. I believe that in combination with the World War II experience, the loss of Robin infused and energized a pre-existing disposition in his head and his heart to always look forward, always move ahead, make the most of every possible moment, because you simply never knew when they were going to be taken away, when the clock would run out, when the Japanese flak would hit the plane, when your little girl would be killed by cancer. I believe that his hyperactivity, his drive was, again, began with his mother, but was 
accentuated and shaped and carried into adulthood by these two experiences. One he had when he was 20, the other when he was only in his mid-30s. So uh, not even quite. He was uh, 31. So the um, those two experiences shape the George Bush who kind of enters the public stage uh, when he comes to um, comes in, into Texas oil, begins to get into politics. His first meal in Texas when he left Yale in 1948 and drove down by himself, George W. and Barbara flew down to meet him later. He stopped in Abilene for a chicken fried steak. He didn't know what it was. Uh, he didn't know if it was a chicken fried like a steak or a steak like a chicken. And so he had three Lone Star beers and it didn't matter. Um, he uh, built a business, built a uh, pretty successful offshore business, a lot of help from uh, the Northeast, a lot of help from Eugene Meyer uh, at the Washington Post who helped stake him. Um, his first political office was the publicity director for the Eisenhower for President campaign in Midland, Texas. Uh, three people voted in the Republican primary that year, George Bush, Barbara Bush, and a drunk who thought he was at the Democratic primary. Um, he then was elected chairman of the Harris County Republican Party in 1962. And his candidacy for that post, see if this has any resonance with what uh, you probably just watched on the news uh, on the way in. He was the candidate of those who thought that perhaps the Republican Party was moving into radical a direction. <laughs> Gee, I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how, uh, you know, as, as Mark Twain said, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so it, it, this rhymes and rhymes and rhymes. The John Birch Society was the problem uh, then, and Bush was sort of the, the handsome, telegenic figure. It's very funny to go back and read the Texas newspapers of the day because all of the reporters who covered him had a cr man crush on George Herbert Walker Bush. He was called Kennedy-esque. He was glamorous. He was handsome. Uh, I mean, again and again and again, he was this enormous sort of larger-than-life figure. Uh, country club matrons would turn their heads, uh, according to the Dallas Morning News, about him. He ran for the Senate in 1964 and begins really his active political career. And I want to talk about three examples. Uh, I know you all know the basics of this. My argument, my central argument about Bush as a uh, politician and as a president is that while he said and did many things that were not especially admirable to amass power, once he did get power, he did everything he could to do the right thing. And so in that sense, because he believed at some level he was destined to serve on the largest of possible stages. And there were contemporary examples of this. This isn't just George Washington and the cherry tree. Uh, his um, sister said of his being shot down that he was meant to be saved. His father-in-law, I don't know about y'all, but my father-in-law has never predicted that I would be president of the United States. Uh, his father-in-law wrote a letter when they were at Yale saying that uh, he thought it was quite possible that Barbara's husband would become president. Senator Bush of Connecticut introduced Bush to the French ambassador here in Washington in the 1950s by saying, this is my son George, he's going to be president of the United States one day. In 1965, I found this in Mrs. Bush's diary, which she generously shared with me. He had a possible primary opponent in a house race, and he went to the man and asked him not to run. And the man said, well, I want to run because I think you are just doing this as a stepping stone for the Senate. And Bush said, no, you're wrong. I'm trying to use it as a stepping stone to be president. Uh, and when I told George W. Bush that, he nearly fell out of his chair. Um, they had not, the family had not quite realized how early uh, George Herbert Walker Bush had been thinking about a pathway to, to the presidency. So, and he always believed he was the best man on the ballot. Now, I think most politicians do, but this was a deep conviction in, 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 his, in his heart. And so, if you believe you're the best person on the ballot, if you believe that you are, in fact, destined for greatness, then any compromise you make along the way becomes not cynical but instrumental to the advancement and achievement of larger goals. You can argue with that Machiavellian interpretation, but I am convinced that that is the, again, the ambient reality of how Bush ran his public career. 
So the three examples where he made a compromise on the front end, but he ultimately did the right thing, I believe, are he opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act when he ran for the Senate in Texas. That's very hard to say these days. It's a piece of American scripture at this point. Uh, in memory of, of President Kennedy, it's set up the Voting Rights Act after Selma the next year. It's a remarkable achievement, part of what expanded Jefferson's definition that all men were created equal, proving the point that the wider we open our arms, the stronger we've become. All of that is true. George Herbert Walker Bush opposed it. But when he was elected to Congress in 1966, what did he do in 1968 in the wake of Dr. King's assassination in April? He voted for open housing to lift racial discrimination from the real estate market in the Fair Housing Act of 1968. He did that against the will of his constituents. He goes back to Houston. There's a ferocious meeting, a hateful meeting, uh, with a lot of words that we don't use anymore and shouldn't have used then, being thrown at him. And he stood there and he took it. He quoted Edmund Burke on the classic line that I don't owe you simply a, a, a reflection of your will. I owe you my judgment. He b barely got out as he thought somewhat alive. He's sitting on a plane getting ready to go back to Washington and a woman comes at him and he sees that look in her eye and he knows it's not going to be good. And so he braces himself for one more attack. And she says, I'm a Democrat, but I believe in what you just did and I will always vote for you. And so at that point, relief washed over him and he flew on. This was the era where he came to believe, as he once put it, that labels are for cans. Uh, in 1966, when he was elected to the House, till 1968, or 67 to 69, when they, the first night the Bushes moved uh, to Millbrook Lane, um, bought the house from Millward Simpson, Alan Simpson's dad. Um, he um, actually invited the moving men to stay over. Barbara had to go to Sears over on Woodley, to uh, over on Wisconsin, to buy sheets so the moving men would have sheets. He was the Pearl Mesta of our presidents, uh, un un unquestionably. But from 67 to 69, he served under a Democratic president. He voted with Lyndon Johnson 53% of the time. A member of the Republican caucus, I'm going to say this again, voted with the Democratic president 53% of the time. So you would think, well, Nixon comes in in January of 69. The next two years, that number must skyrocket where Bush supported the administration, right? It soars to 55%. So this was a man who called them as he saw them. He believed that he owed his constituents his judgment. And so he voted with the administration when he agreed, voted against when he disagreed. Almost impossible to imagine today those kinds of numbers. Um, that was his Washington. That was the Washington where he came of age. He said to President Johnson, I'm never going to attack you personally. I'm sure Lyndon appreciated that. I'm not sure it was on his mind. Um, I thought about Johnson at a later moment in Bush's career where um, in 1970, when he's going to run for the Senate, he goes to see Johnson to ask him his advice about should he stay in the House with the Ways and Means Committee or should he run for the Senate ultimately against Lloyd Benson. And Johnson said, um, well, you know, George, I've had a privilege of serving in the House and I've served in the Senate. And there is a difference. And Bush said, what is that difference, Mr. President? And Johnson said, son, do you know the difference between chicken shit and chicken salad? <laughs> and the son of Greenwich Country Day and Andover and Yale said, yes, I think I can sort through that, that metaphor, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, once when Bush was totally exhausted campaigning in Iowa, in New Hampshire in 1980, he actually shook the hand of a department store mannequin. <laughs> Johnson would have tried to register him. <laughs> and God knows what Clinton would have done. Uh, so, uh, do that all sort of. So, his... That was the first example. The civil rights is, is his Washington was one where you called it like you saw it and, and did, did, did it well. Um, the second is the 1988 campaign is hardly an example 
of a high-minded, issues-oriented debate. Uh, I think we can probably get a quorum on that in this zip code. Um, it was hard-hitting. It was tough. It was, as they say uh, in the consultant community, it was comparative. Um, but what does he do once he becomes president? He invites every member of Congress he can possibly imagine down to the White House. He tries to establish a kinder, gentler culture here. He uh, takes one-step pictures, the Polaroid one-step, of members of Congress sitting on the Lincoln bed. He uh, is, uses the residents uh, more than any modern president to ha have folks up. He showed off Millie and the puppies. Turns out he took showers with Millie, which is probably one of the details I wish I did not know. Uh, there's always a question, isn't there, about biographers about too much information. The fact that he showered with a Springer Spaniel, I think, is in that qualification. Um, yes, you ended the Cold War, but we always have to have that image that he showered with a Springer Spaniel. Thanks for sharing with us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Rumsfeld did not do that. Um, he might have been a nicer, you know, no, no. Uh, might have been happier if he'd done that. Um, so what does he do as president? He passes the Americans with Disabilities Act. He passes the Clean Air Act amendments, which is essentially still our environmental policy. And in 1990, on June 26, 1990, he puts out a press release in one of the worst pieces of uh, uh, ad advance work uh, in White House history, announcing that his No New Taxes pledge no longer applies. And he has decided to put taxes on the table in order to get a budget that would work and avoid sequestration and possibly uh, falling markets and a, and a crashing economy. He said, read my lips to get elected. Less than two years later, what does he do? He raises taxes. Is that cynical? Perhaps. But was it good for the country? Yes. It set up the prosperity of the 90s. It did budget. It's set in process uh, pay-go rules. It was the right thing to do. And it sent the right wing of the Republican Party into a fit from which they have not yet recovered uh, in many ways. The last Eisenhower Republican, George H.W. Bush, intersected fatally with Newt Gingrich, who was the first Gingrich Republican. And I would argue that we, there's some Gingrich Republicans still, still running around. Uh, Vin Weber told me, a uh, former congressman from Minnesota, told me a, an, an amazing story about this. Um, and in one of our wing, those, one of those wing of a butterfly moments about how things could have happened if, they, if something else had gone wrong. My favorite one is in December 1932, uh, t both Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill almost died. Uh, an assassin tried to kill Roosevelt in Miami. He shot the mayor of Chicago, who was sitting next to FDR. Instead, Churchill, after a long night with some Johnny Walker Red, which is just to say he was respirating, um, walks out on Fifth Avenue and looks left instead of right because he thought he was in London, and he's hit by a car and almost dies. Now, does anyone here think that the end of the 1930s and the early 1940s would be the same if both Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill had died in 1932? I don't, and that's not just because I would not have wanted to write a book called Clement and Wendell. Um, but individuals matter. Individual lives, lives matter. And so here's what happened in 1989. The United States Senate rejects the nomination of John Tower of Texas to be Secretary of Defense. Bush wants to move quickly to get someone confirmable. He pulls the House Republican whip out of the House leadership to become Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney becomes the defense secretary, elevating his national stature. Newt Gingrich runs in the Republican caucus to become the Republican whip, and therefore is in a position to move up the House leadership and set up ultimately what happened in 1994. So the Tower, the failure of the Tower nomination in some ways created ripples in American life and history that we're still feeling. Um, so. But Bush, being Bush, always wanted to reach out, believed in compromise, did not believe it was a dirty word, believed in moderation. And so he um, invites both Gingrich and Vin Weber, and Vin had run his campaign uh, within the House caucus, uh, run Gingrich's campaign. And as Weber said, no one had, no president had ever thought to invite the campaign manager 
for the House whip race. You know, only Bush would do that. So they're having a beer in the residence with John Sununu and the president. And Weber and Gingrich can tell that there's something President Bush is not saying that he wants to say. And so as they're leaving, Weber says, Mr. President, tell us what worries you most about us. And without hesitating, Bush said, I worry that sometimes your idealism may get in the way of what I think of as sound governance. And Weber said he always appreciated that it was only George Bush who would say idealism, not ideology, not nuttiness, not inflexibility. He said idealism. He gave Weber and Gingrich the credit that they believed this. But he had a view that idealism and sound governance were not always going to be parallel, that they were sometimes going to be in conflict. When the tax pledge was broken and a reporter called Gingrich and then Gingrich called Weber and told him, Weber knew then that that's what Bush had had in mind. But I think there's something to commend in a president who believed that his own party's hardcore believers were sometimes going to have to stand down in the cause of a larger initiative to help the country at large. So these are the, the three big ones, uh, civil rights, taxes, the basic kind and gentler culture of, of 88. And I really think that the more time passes, and it's been 25 years, it's about as long as separates Roosevelt's campaign for a third term from the Great Society, uh, or the Great Society from uh, the, uh, the 1990 budget deal, long time. This is like writing about uh, President Kennedy well into the Reagan administration. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of us lived through all this, so sometimes it feels like yesterday and sometimes it feels like Thermopylae. Um, it's somewhere in between the two. Uh, so I just want to say something about three other general questions, points about stuff that changed while he was president and then uh, take your, see what's on your minds. Um, the first is one of the reasons he was a one-term president was this rise of reflexive partisanship. He, he just couldn't imagine doing something like what Gingrich did. It just wasn't part of his makeup. Uh, the freelance partisanship, standing there it's, it, uh, while C-SPAN was on and addressing the empty chamber, going around the party apparatus, which Gingrich did, uh, making, their, making litmus tests out of issue after issue, that kind of partisanship simply wasn't part of Bush's makeup and it happened under his feet, and he couldn't master it. The other is it was the beginning of the 24-hour news cycle in many ways. Uh, the, the Internet was not with us yet, but CNN was adding a lot of shows. Opinion shows were growing. Uh, Bush himself in his diary talks about the heraldoization of politics. Uh, he actually at one point says, you know, some left-handed hermaphrodite, you know, has some damn opinion about something. Um, <laughs> I don't know why he was interested in hermaphrodites. Maybe he was just early on our own cultural exchange experiences. Um, but that cycle, and, you, and one thing that links both the reflexive partisanship and the cycle is talk radio. Rush Limbaugh's audience was going like this in the Bush years. And in fact, Bush, uh, Limbaugh endorsed Pat Buchanan in Buchanan's challenge in 92. But what does George Bush do? He invited Limbaugh to the White House to spend the night. <laughs> Carried his bag for him. That shut down the Limbaugh machine. Seriously. Uh, he invited him over. He be, Limbaugh was, in, by, but by the time, by the end of the campaign, Limbaugh was introducing him at campaign events uh, in the very last days of the campaign against, against Clinton. And the third thing is, and also what surprised me the most in, in doing this project, was the contrast between the public Bush and the private Bush. Bill Clinton told us he felt our pain, but George Bush really did. He just couldn't show it. He thought it was beneath his dignity. And we can argue all night long about whether it was or not. But he did not believe presidents should show too much emotion in public. 
One place that it broke my heart on this, so much so that I put it in the prologue of the book, is when he was vice president in what must be one of the worst pieces of White House advance in history, he was shown into a children's leukemia ward in Krakow and didn't know where he, didn't know where he was headed. Comes in, he realizes where he is, he begins to cry. The, all the photographers, all the press corps is behind him. And he won't turn around until he's gathered himself together. Because if he turns around, the story's not about them, but about him. Now, I know a lot of politicians. One of my many character flaws is I like politicians. And I can't think of many who would stand there, as George Herbert Walker Bush did, in that leukemia ward, trying to pull himself together so that he did not create a distracting moment for this Polish hospital and these children. But that's what he did. And so I think the rise of confessional politics, he just couldn't go on Arsenio Hall. It just wasn't part of who he was. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's, it is a historical fact of the matter. I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, because, again, the thing that surprised me most was, in fact, his, how sweet and, and, and noble ultimately he was. He was imperfect. There, there were sins and shortcomings, but all political lives have those. Uh, this is a letter that uh, President Bush wrote to his mother <clears throat> in the late 1950s after the births of Neil and Marvin. So there are four boys at this point, George W., Jeb, Neil, Marvin. And it's, it's about Robin. It's about within six or seven, maybe eight years, it's undated, after she was after she had died. This is the voice of George Bush. There is about our house a need, the running, pulsating restlessness of the four boys as they struggle to learn and grow. Yes, the world embraces them, but all this wonder needs a counterpart. We need some starch, crisp frocks to go with all our blue jeans and helmets. We need some soft blonde hair to offset those crew cuts. We need a dollhouse to stand firm against our forts and rackets and baseball cards. We need a legitimate Christmas angel, one who doesn't have cuffs beneath the dress. We need someone who's afraid of frogs. We need someone to cry when I get mad, not argue. We need a little one who can kiss without leaving egg or jam or gum. We need a girl. We had one once. She'd fight and cry and play and make her way just like the rest. But there was about her a certain softness. She was patient. Her hugs were just a little less wiggly. She'd climb in to sleep with me, and somehow she'd fit. She didn't wake me up with pug nose and mischievous eyes, a challenging quarter inch from my sleeping face. No, she'd stand beside our bed till I felt her there, silently and comfortable, She'd put those precious, fragrant locks against my chest and fall asleep. Her peace made me feel strong and so very important. My daddy had a caress, a certain ownership which touched a slightly different spot than the high dad I love so much. But she is still with us. We need her and yet we have her. We can't touch her and yet we can feel her. We hope she'll stay in our house for a long, long time. I asked the president to read that out loud to me during an interview. Long before he finished, he was sobbing in a, in a deeply physical way, so much so that his chief of staff came into the office, heard him and came into the office, and she asked me why I'd asked the president to do that. And I said, if you want to know someone's heart, and before I could finish the sentence, the president said, you have to know what breaks it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions I can attempt? Are we okay on time? Oh, there's a mic there. Y'all know what you're doing. I don't. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, some, uh, that was a great, uh, 
great presentation Thank you. and uh, some wonderful stories. Uh, Why do I feel there's a but coming? Yeah, well, <laughs> the but is that um, I'm very curious as to why uh, you didn't mention Barbara Moore. Oh. Uh, I'm very curious as to how Mama Bush felt about Papa Bush airing so much of the, um, of the family's laundry. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a very waspish thing to do, I don't think. Right. And uh, I'm just curious as to how she felt about the book after it was published. That's a great question. I, 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 I can't wait to find out. Um, <laughs> let me put it this way. I know when she finishes, I will know. Um, I have no doubt of that. Uh, I found Mrs. Bush, let me back up a second. I found Mrs. Bush to be enormously generous and helpful with this. She let me read a diary she kept from 1948 until now. The only condition on this project was that anything I wanted to quote from her diary, I had to clear with her. Not interpretation, not the context, but just the quotation. President Bush's diaries were given to me with no conditions whatever. So they could be quoted. He had no right of review, wasn't interested in it, really. Um, his, his belief was you let, his, you let history, history sort it out. Um, Mrs. Bush uh, wanted, obviously, to, to uh, totally reasonably wanted to look at it, wanted to, wanted to look at the quotations. I took her 90 pages, and we sat together one afternoon, and it was fascinating to watch her reading it. Uh, and she would say at one point, my, I was an awfully opinionated 38-year-old. <laughs> you know, the, the chronological apple doesn't fall far from the tree, ma'am. Uh, you know, at 90, you're not exactly retiring. Um, uh, so she was a vital part of this book. Uh, in the same way, she was a vital part of George Herbert Walker Bush's life. Without her, he would not have been president. Uh, the choices he made in his life that I think, in retrospect, clearly brought him to the pinnacle were marrying Barbara Pierce, um, moving to Texas. If he had not moved to Texas, he would have just been another New England Republican, and we know how well that's turned out. Uh, there are three left, um, and I think they've moved. Um, uh, when he moved to Texas in the early 1960s, uh, the Democrats came to him and said, just come be a Democrat on the conservative side with John Conley and others, and you can be governor, you can be senator, the sky's the limit. And he said, no, I'm a Republican. So for those who think he was totally craven and totally opportunistic, I would point you to 1960-61 when he was a Texas, when he was one of the few Republicans in Texas, uh, this, this moment was probably, you think, even before Tower was elected in 61, as in the special election because of President Johnson, uh, Vice President Johnson uh, being elected with President Kennedy. Um, so in one of the moments he cried uh, was when I asked, did you think that when you married Mrs. Bush, did you know that she had 42 moves in her and could raise these this family uh, while you were building a business? building a political career and he immediately started to cry and he said i ask that way no because but but she was always there she was the rock um and she still is she is his most ferocious defender um uh even now believe me i we had lunch two weeks ago and um more or less and um you know she still tenderly watches over him they've become very um I don't want to be too sentimental here, but particularly since he went into the wheelchair in uh, 2012 because of a form of vascular Parkinson's, he, he can't move his legs, um, uh, they become very tactile in also an unwaspy way. Um, they hold hands a lot more. Um, I've been privileged to be able to talk about the project on several occasions in front of them. They've been very emotional about it. I feel... Um, I feel deeply honored by their trust, and so I hope when she finishes, she will find that the book was commensurate with that trust. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess a kind of change of theme here a little bit. Uh, just um, wondering what uh, you've learned from him, not only in the diaries, but in your, in your conversations uh, with him in recent years about 
Um, his opinion of how to deal with Russia, both during and since the fall of the Soviet Union, and have you detected a sort of any change in uh, opinion about how to how to deal with Russia, how to and, and now how to deal with Putin? You know, he. You mean because out of the fallout of the Soviets? Yeah, just yeah. over the over the years since 1990, 91. Yeah, um, has his. Attitude. What was his attitude then, at the time when he was sure. president, and has it changed in any uh, real way? And how does it relate to other opinions within the Republican Party, for example, yeah. or just generally from Americans yeah. in general? I can speak more to the first part of that uh, than the than the second. I we would chat about current events, but it was always cutting into time when I was trying to get him to remember stuff about climbing the trees. Um, in Greenwich and that sort of thing. That and George Herbert Walker Bush, as you all may remember, is not the most linear of interview subjects. So I tried chron chronology for a while and that was a disaster. Um, so then I would say, so Gorbachev, your mother, Barbara, Putin, you know, and, and he, he was, he was much, his, for instance, he was always much better at press conferences than he was at set piece speeches, uh, partly because his mind moved, moved quickly. Um, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Christmas Day, 1992, it dissolves. Um, arguably, his reaction to the fall of the wall uh, was an essential step. Um, one of the things I've, I've been wanting to point out to folks along the way is, which I hadn't quite focused on until I was doing this, is Bush gets a lot of credit now for not dancing on the wall because he was able to put himself, you know, his, his nickname as a child, his childhood nickname was half, half, because he would cut desserts in half and give it to the, his friends or cut treats in half and give it to them. So half, half Bush was more diplomatic uh, than hawkish. Uh, and during the, the fall of the wall, and as he once put it in a classic Bush malapropism, I didn't want to stick it in Gorbachev's ear. I, I think he meant I, but I'm not. I'm still not sure. He also once worried aloud that I would look, look into him and I would find an empty deck of cards, which I think he meant either not a full deck or an empty suit. But I'm still I'm still a little a little fuzzy on exactly what he meant. Um, but he was viewing Berlin through the prism of Tiananmen, a totalitarian regime had just been threatened right. not long before. June 4th, June 5th, June 6th of that year. And the East Germans were running a pro-government documentary about how great the Chinese government reaction to Tiananmen was that fall. So he was very, he was very much, very much able to put himself in the hardliners' positions. Um, he was criticized, as you know, from the beginning for being too close to Gorbachev, for believing that Gorbachev was the only bet. I, Cold War historians can sort that out. My own view is that the Soviet Union existed when he became president, and it didn't exist when he left. Um, as far as what's happened since then with Russia, I think I know that his essential view of foreign policy was it was a process, an, a never-ending process of what he called working the problem. He believed in stability above all. He believed in uh, order, uh, sometimes to a fault. Gorbachev to him meant order, uh, even late into 91 and the coup. Um, he gave the speech in Kiev, which is now known as the Chicken Kiev speech. If you read it whole, it's, it's not as bad as all that. But um, what he said in that speech that was so uh, upset conservatives in particular in the United States and Ukrainians was freedom is not the same as independence, which is an interesting nuanced thought. Uh, he believed in order. He believed that uh, the Soviet empire was falling, but that it should move at a pace that would increase stability as opposed to increase instability. Um, in terms of what he would do about Putin now, I, I don't know. I obviously, I, I will say this. I, I think given what's been in the news the past three or four days and the past three or four years, Bush was able to operate on two different levels, uh, Bush Sr. He was able to build a coalition of 35 nations when he needed to, but he was also quite willing to go alone if he had to. 
Um, there was a George Bush who talked about Saddam in terms of good versus evil. There was a George Bush who was willing to risk impeachment to go and uh, go to war with Iraq, and that was George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, George, George Bush, the diplomat, has been elevated largely by those opponents of his son into this combination, as, is, as I sometimes think of him as Adelaide Stevenson and Cyrus Vance, um, partly because it, he became a useful s stick with which to beat 43 about the head. Um, we should not forget that George Herbert Walker Bush was quite willing to use American force when necessary, and I think would be operating on those two levels now. Thank you. Yes. Great. How does Mr. Bush uh, view his legacy to the nation, to the world, to history? And do you think he's correct? Uh, he, you know, he hates that question, but I like it. That's good. Thank you. I don't say that personally. Uh, uh, he calls it the L word. There are a lot of a lot of character words. There's the D word. You can't say dynasty. There's the L word. Um, you can't say legacy. Um, it's fascinating. I interviewed President Obama for this book, uh, partly because President Obama had, I knew from some reporting that Obama had a great interest in Bush 41, particularly early on when things were not going particularly well for Obama. Uh, a top aide of his called me one summer night. Um, I was in Sewanee uh, sitting on a porch um, and the phone rang and it was the White House. And so I took the call. Um, you, know, you know, I was I was free, you know, uh, and uh, this is big of me. You know, it's just, it's I'm, I'm I'm a citizen of the world, uh, and they wanted to know about the I don't think I've ever told the story before. They wanted to know about exactly what Bush had known about the political fallout of breaking the Read My Lips pledge. They were they were trying to craft a one term. A, a justification for a possible one-term presidency as they pushed Obamacare. Was it worth it? What did he know? It was really interesting. Um, I might have put that in the book, but I forgot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I put them. The, there'll be an e-book soon. Um, uh, but so then he gave, then President Obama gave um, Bush the Medal of Freedom. Uh, great day. I, I, I was fortunate enough to be there. Uh, Stan Musial was there and John Lewis. It was just a great. But those, those, if you want to feel great about America, watch those on C-SPAN. They're just fabulous. Um, and then I called and then we did a telephone interview and probably in March of this year. And the president said, the best measure of a president I know is to what extent did he put the country first? And my view of George H.W. Bush is that as president and ever since, he has always put the country first. Three weeks ago, I was in Houston, and a, a, a reporter who was in the room asked Bush, what, what do you hope your legacy is? And he said, I hope they will say that we put the country first. Nice. So, we have time for two quick Sorry. Two my answers are too long. I'm sorry. I remember one personal and private moment uh, that the president let us all um, see. It was on the morning of his inauguration. Um, <coughs> the service at the National Cathedral was broadcast uh, on that morning. And I was really moved. I remember seeing him kneeling. And it seemed like, um, as a friend in the Marines says, he was praying his guts out. Hmm. Did you talk to him much? Do you talk in your book about his Christian faith? I do. I do. Um now, he's an Episcopalian, so it's a close call. Um, that's the only ethnic joke I can make. <laughs> that's it. Unless you want, you know, Chattanooga jokes. Um, I, I do. I, I, he does talk about prayer. Uh, he, he has, a, he has a, I think, an apocryphal, but, but a very real uh, sense of, of a Lincoln quotation in his head that he sometimes went to his knees because he had nowhere else to go. Um, it is, it's also true that he has a tragic sensibility about the world. He says in, in the diary, on the, in the run-up to the Gulf, he says, in probably the day or two before the air war, I want to pray, but I'm not sure my prayers are heard. Now, I find doubt to be the oxygen of faith, and so I find that remark to actually 
underscore the fact that he believes in a providential order in a theocentric universe. Um, he is a high and dry Episcopalian. Um, I've got, I've been to church with him on a number of occasions. Um, and, uh, I think I understand his faith in a way, um, uh, as much as an outsider can just because of the, the similarity of the traditions. And he believes that to whom much is given, much is expected, as the New Testament says. And he believes that, um, that there is a larger order and that one owes a duty to that order. Um, he answers the question, are you born again, uh, when that became an issue in the 88 campaign when he was running against Pat Robertson. Came in, remember, he came in third in Iowa in 1988, Bob Dole, Pat Robertson, George Bush. He said he had no, he had no single moment where he accepted Jesus and felt saved, but that there had been many such moments which is a deft Anglican way to get out of that particular question. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a Northern Episcopalian. Oh, good. There are three of us now. Well, I graduated from Kenyon College, and since you're from Swanee, you must know well, at least that it was created so Southern Episcopalians would not go to Kenyon, the College of Edwin Stanton. Y'all have been saying, y'all have been making that up. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a true story. Swanee was found. If we want to, if we want to clear the room, we can get into Kenyan Swanee ecclesiastical politics. Then it would be the reverse. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, my, you know, my you, observation, you can always come home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the past is never past. Right? Right. Faulkner. I mean. All right, I'm not going to. All right, and go it, ahead. My you, observation you win. is, I, since I'm a former Kissinger biographer and a CIA analyst, I went right to Bob Gates in your inner index. Sure. I don't recall seeing, you can correct me on this, that you mentioned the highly controversial nomination of Gates to be CIA director in the summer of 91. And Gates pulled back three yeah. years earlier because certain senators felt he committed perjury about what he knew about right. Iran-Contra. Right. And I would just make an observation that about 50 analysts uh, told the committee they were screaming out there at Langley when that nomination was made. Now, Boren got him through. But I don't recall, you can correct me on this, that yeah. th that is this minuet you have to do with Iran-Contra. It is a delicate topic yeah. in your book, but yeah. I didn't see anything in your book about Gates's nomination. It's the second one. No, you're right. Uh, there's not anything in there about that. Um, but you seem to know enough, so you're okay. Um, <laughs> Touché. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> you threw Faulkner and Kenyon at me, buddy. <laughs> you want more? One more here, sir. <laughs> I want to do a follow-up on Iran-Contra. I have not got that in the book yet, but I scanned the New York Times uh, book review uh, yesterday, and they sort of said you were unhappy with the former president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, about him not being uh, direct and transparent with you on that issue. I remember from my days messing around in that area that he had a wonderful CIA guy yep. named Don Gregg, who was his national security guy when he was vice, when Bush was vice That's president. Right. Part of his job was to, when the nasty people from Central America came up selling all sorts of crap, he was to take him in the other room, sit down, give him a cup of coffee and prevent him from seeing the vice president of the United States because Bush was smart, and Bush wanted to get into everything, and when he got into everything, like that nasty stuff, he got in trouble. How does that jibe with what's in here? I haven't got there yet. I think it jibes. Um, I, I, my view of President, uh, Vice President Bush on Iran-Contra is uh, basically George Schultz's, uh, which is that uh, when the news first broke in that consequential first week of November 1986, when the Republicans lost the Senate, uh, the news of the arms sales broke, the 88 campaign is starting up, Bush denied that there had been arms sales to Iran. Uh, Schultz goes to see him at the residence uh, that weekend and says, you were there, you approved it, you got to knock it off. Uh, Bush sort of rises up a, a bit grumpily. Uh, Schultz goes off. They parted with some tension in Secretary of State Schultz's uh, recollection. But then Bush thought about it and realized Schultz was right. 
Jim Baker later told George Shultz, you may have just saved the vice president's political career. Um, so he and, and, and Bush got on board fairly quickly for a for a clean, cleaner slate. He volunteered to take a lie detector test uh, in order to lead what became the Tower Commission. He wanted to do that. Uh, neither idea went anywhere. But his first instinct was to be an old spy master and a realist and to uh, and to push it push it away. Um, as, as far as Don Gregg goes, I, I, I talked with him. Uh, he wrote a very good memoir, uh, which I recommend. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was a complicated time. They, at one point they were dealing with a Bay of Pigs veteran who was running uh, aid through Honduras and had Oliver North. I mean, this is a I can also write a novel about it for you. You know, I mean, it's just given those agree- ingredients, it was going to not look great. But the idea that George Bush was not in the loop is a uh, is a is a almost a Clintonian formulation. Um, he was not in the operational loop, but he was at key meetings where this was decided. Uh, and look, the man was in public life from 1962 until now. Um, no political life is without blemish. This is a blemish, uh, but we have to take them all in all. And as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. once said, self-righteousness in retrospect is easy, also cheap. Thank you all very much.